are very fortunate to have an internal speaker this time, in the sense that he's from uh, within ISYE, Dagi Gabriel, uh, and he has been working on predictive analytics uh, in various contexts. Uh, and today he's going to tell us a bit on how that might impact supply chains, and that should be a topic of interest to almost everyone here in the room for sure. So, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, and thank you, uh, Tim, uh, for this uh, invitation. Thank you all for uh, coming and uh, attending this uh, talk. Um, so my name is Nagy Gabriel. I'm, a, uh, I'm an associate professor in the School of Industrial and Systems Engineering. Uh, first of all, can all of you hear me well at the back? Everyone okay? Very nice. Okay. And yes, sir. My mic isn't? Oh. It's on. It's all good. Sorry. Okay. How, how about now? Is that a little better? Or should I talk louder? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, uh, again, name is uh, Nagy Gabriel, uh, Associate Professor in the School of Industrial and Systems Engineering. I work in predictive analytics uh, on the industrial side. So, the first thing I'm going to do is scope predictive analytics uh, in the context of this uh, presentation because predictive analytics in supply chain has a lot of applications. So, you have demand analytics. Uh, you have procurement analytics, transportation analytics, and optimization-centered analytics where you have an optimization model and you're running sensitivity analyses and trying, you know, different scenarios and seeing what costs to minimize, how profits are impacted, and so on. These are still analytics uh, procedures. Now, um, they're mostly centered on inventory, optimization, replenishment optimization, supply, net, uh, supply uh, chain network optimization, and so on. So uh, this talk is none of the above. So it focuses mainly on the service side of supply chain. And uh, essentially, although most of the focus in research, and even in the industry, has been on supply chain of raw materials and finished goods, there has been little work in the area of spare parts, logistics, or the supply chain of spare parts. Why is this important? Because more and more, there are more complex equipment, especially in the industry, that requires maintenance and requires service. And more industries are nowadays looking into profiting from what we call service contracts. So a company like GE or a company like Siemens, they sell gas turbines, huge gas turbines, huge generators that are usually installed in substations, uh, power substations, uh, to provide us electricity. And along with that, they sell a service contract. That service contract sometimes has profit margins that can reach up to a 40% profit margin. So they actually make much more money on their service contracts than on actually selling the asset, right? And with that service comes a lot of challenges. They start monitoring, remotely monitoring those equipment, understanding the behavior of that equipment, how it's performing, how it's operating, and they are in charge of making it available all the time to the customer. That includes supplying spare parts, supplying maintenance, personnel and maintenance resources. And this is the scope that I'll be uh, focusing on. So, as I said, this talk focuses more on supply chain of spare parts, and for short, I'm going to call it service supply chain. Um, and just to give you an example of why this is important, we mostly have the conventional approach to supply chain or the classic perspective to supply chain, which is mostly, on the, again, on the finished goods and the raw materials. But if you look at a company like Southern Company, which uh, uh, Georgia Power is, is, is one of the uh, uh, subsidiaries, they carry $1.5 billion worth of spare parts. They keep them tied up, and they don't use any supply chain uh, uh, models to model those spare parts. And most of them, most of the time, 30% of those uh, spare parts that are stored 
end up being obsolete. They get stored for a year, two years, sometimes three years. And after a while, they, got, uh, they get obsolete because the equipment is now turned around and new equipment is brought in and they still carry them up till today. They still carry most of these and to go in and actually sort through and sift through which of these spare parts are obsolete and which of them are actually active uh, or necessary is a big headache. The same thing can be said about the airline industry. Delta carries $1 billion worth of spare part equipment for their airlines. So it is a huge problem and if you're able to make a small dent in that, in that figure, the impact is really huge. Okay. Now, the mainstream supply chain is essentially focusing on, I'm going to have a, you know, I'm going to classify this in, at, at a very high level and I'm not, I don't claim to be a supply chain expert. So forgive me if I, uh, you know, ruin this classification, but there is a huge body of literature and research on understanding demand of finished goods, demand on the spare parts, on the, uh, sorry, raw materials. And there is another body of literature that focuses on actually optimizing the chain. So you're looking at transportation networks, transshipments, uh, distribution depots, and so on. And both feed into each other. You can start with the lower problem and drive the upper problem. You know, we have heard about incentivizing the customer through, uh, Contra through you know discounting and other other in incentive uh, incentive uh, based approaches, and or you can just focus on the top, understanding the demand, which then drives your uh, optimization of the supply chain. This is mainstream, okay. And this focuses on finished goods and raw materials. In a parallel universe, we have the service supply chain. The same optimization models that are driving the networks can be migrated into uh, that domain, and they have been migrated into that domain. So there, are, there is a huge body of literature that focuses on optimizing spare part supply chain, but these are the optimization models for the shipping, transshipments, and all, and, 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 and all related uh, uh, aspects of that. However, the key piece that's missing is actually understanding the demand. You cannot take your understanding of raw materials and finished goods and migrate it into the spare part domain. It's very difficult. You can, but it's not optimal. It's not going to be optimal. And the spare part world is, is much different in terms of analytics. Okay, so let's start with a very simple example. Uh, a manufacturing machine uses a specialized cutting tool to produce parts. You have eight spare parts that are available in storage with which to complete a 40 hour production. So you need to, you have a job order, you need to complete a production run for 40 hours. It will take you 40 hours. These tools wear out and they need to be changed. And you have in storage eight spares. What's the probability of completing the production run with the available tools? Right? So you have this in storage, and you want to make sure that you actually deliver on time without having a hiccup given the storage that you have. Make sense? Easy problem? Easy problem. Now, another way to state it is we're trying to find the probability that the ninth failure, right? or the ninth replacement will be greater than 40 hours of production. Does that make sense? Very good. Now I'm st starting to talk about failures. I'm bringing in failures, right? So failures and spare parts are really tied, correct? So you need to, given that there is failure and given that the failure process is uncertain, which mirrors your uncertainty about the demand in the raw material and the finished goods universe, right? There is a demand from the customer. You can study customer behavior. You can study market, market behaviors and, uh, uh, and all that stuff to understand your demand better. Failure process drives your demand in the spare part universe. Does that make sense? So now you enter into my world, which is reliability. 
failure or time to failure distributions. You have a distribution that characterizes the lifetimes right, of uh, equipment or components on machinery. And you need to understand how they fail so that you will be able to integrate that with your uh, supply chain optimization. So if I define, hypothetically, a statistical distribution for the lifetime of this tool as having a mean of five hours and a standard deviation of plus or minus you know, one hour, right? I can make a quick calculation and come up with a probability that the nine or the eight spare parts that I have plus the one that's on the machine will satisfy this production run. So I'm 95% confident, which is the last figure right here, I'm 95% confident that I will be able to satisfy this with the storage capability that I have. Easy problem? Make sense? Okay, good. We can actually reword this problem in the following. A manufacturing machine uses a specialized cutting tool to produce the parts given a time to failure distribution of that tool. I am interested in how many spare parts should I have to ensure that I will be able to complete this production run with a X percentage of confidence. Did I do anything? I just reversed, I just reworded the problem, right? Very good. So what I'm trying to say here is service supply chain and reliability go hand in hand. If you do not have, if you are unable to integrate reliability with service supply chain, then you will never get a, uh, a coherent supply chain model that actually characterizes your scenario. Make sense, everyone? Very good. So let me introduce you to reliability, okay? Up to now, I didn't say anything about analytics, right? I will get there. So how do you do reliability? Reliability essentially focuses on analyzing aggregate data. So typically, if you're a UPS facility, if you're a FedEx, you have maintenance orders where, okay, we need to change the brakes on this car, the hydraulics on that truck, and so on and so forth. And these maintenance events are registered as times of failure or times of repair. If I have a bunch of data, I can mine data mining, mine that data, and do a simple statistical analysis. This gives me a histogram of how many repairs or how many failures did I have after how many cumulative hours. So I have a few failures at the very beginning after let's say a month of operation or a couple of months of operation. And then more failures after three or four months and so on. And then I have some of these uh, uh, components on, on some of these equipment or machinery or whatever transportation uh, uh, vehicles you have last a long time, you know, they have good genes. So you have now a statistical distribution, right? This statistical distribution can now be used to assess whether your repair process is optimal or not, right? So typically, the uncertainty here is governed by the distribution, right? So I can have failures that occur very early. I can have failures that last too long. And my understanding of this distribution is going to govern my demand on the spare part, right? So if I can quantify and formalize that statistical distribution very well, I have a very coherent grasp on the demand of that spare part. And as such, I can optimize my entire sub spare part supply chain based on that. Because the same steps that a finished good goes through once it's manufactured until it hits the, the market is, are very similar to the steps for the spare parts. Except that these spare parts are going to be sitting, the, your customer now is another company. Make sense? Very good. Now, what's interesting about this is that most of the repairs or the maintenance in the industry are done in a periodic basis. So.
3,000 miles, I have to go and change the oil of my car. Right? Who said that that's correct? It's just Jeffy Lube, right? They said it's, it's the right thing to do. They give you a tag, you know. But did they look at the condition of the car, the make, how new it is, how old it is? Do you think these things affect? Absolutely, right? They, they impact. But the problem is the maturity of reliability in the industrial world is not that high. So there are very few people who actually know that, that science. It's a huge uh, uh, research field in industrial engineering and engineering statistics. Um, so what, what do they do? The best that they can do is actually characterize this distribution, if they can. Most of them don't even get there. And then they come up with some, something called a MTTF, mean time to failure, or a mean time between failures. right? And based on that, they have a safety factor where they say, OK, I'm just going to do my, my replacements right before the mean time between failure or the, the mean time to failure. And so every time I'm just going to do it every three months or quarterly or every 3,000 miles based on the usage and so on, things become very ad hoc. Does that make sense? Very good. Now, what happens in this region? What's this red region? These are the components that didn't even live up to your PM interval, right? They failed prematurely. Is this a reality? Absolutely. Because you have this range of uncertainty, which is characterized by the statistical distribution, right? And these are high impact. So you have a premature failure. You have a gas turbine you know, crashing, one of its blades fracturing, eliminating a whole section of that gas turbine, a transformer blowing up. These are premature failures. Do they occur? Absolutely. How is their impact? It's exceptionally high. Now, what about this region, the green region? The green region are the things that you remove or you repair due to the fact that you have an ad hoc calendar-based or periodic-based maintenance policy. So you go to a nuclear power plant. Every three months, they have to disassemble a pump, a cooling pump, every three months. Disassemble it put it back together, it takes it offline. They can have redundant systems that you know, they switch between. But the problem is they stay two or three weeks tweaking it to get it back to where it was prior to them taking it offline and disassembling it. Just doesn't make sense, right? And even if, so when, when you do unnecessary maintenance, you think that you're improving the status of, of the health of that asset or making sure that everything is okay, which is true, true. But if you do it so many times, there are two things that's, that are going to happen, right? Your availability of that asset is going to plummet, correct? Every time you're taking it offline. Imagine that you're changing the oil of your car every 300 miles instead of every 3,000 miles. You'll be sleeping at Jeffy Loop, right? So, and then another thing. There is, you're making the asset prone to human error, right? I disassembled something, put it back together, and there is one bolt. What are you going to do? There is one bolt that's sitting there. You forgot, right? After putting everything together, but it, I mean, it looks fine, but I forgot this one little bolt, right? So again, managing between this premature replacement and unexpected failure is kind of a tricky balance. And the key here to save money is to do what? To make this curve, this statistical curve, as narrow as possible, right? By reducing your uncertainty, you are going to minimize the red region and minimize your green region. If I had a magic wand and I understood all the physics and the chemical reactions that take place through a failure process, then I wouldn't have uncertainty. I will have a deterministic process. I will know exactly when this thing is going to fail. Are there models like that? For very specific components, there are. For very specific failure modes, there are. But they are not scalable to other types of failure processes and other modes. And that's why data-driven approaches like this are very valuable. So what can I do with reliability, with that curve? Well, let's look at two small costs. You have your 
failure cost, which is the cost of replacing or, or repairing something after it fails, which is a disaster, right? It's definitely going to be higher than your second cost, which is the cost of planned replacement. Make sense? Very good. So what can I do? I can actually integrate my reliability with a replacement, a simple age replacement cost model, and come up with an optimal time to repair, an optimal time to replace this component. Okay? If I have the repair, which is TR, optimal time to repair corresponds to this lowest point here because the y-axis here is the cost per unit time and the x-axis is the replacement time. So as you progress, as you march a long time, if you replace too early, if your frequency of, of replacing is too, uh, is too much or you're replacing too early, then your cost is very high. Then you, have a, you hit a sweet spot right here. And if you pass that sweet spot, you start incurring more money because now you're risking unexpected failure as you march along. Make sense? And all this, the width of this curve and the shape of this curve is highly dependent on your reliability distribution. Given that I have scheduled my repair process, what can I do? I can now take my repair process and then pass it to the spare part inventory guy. Okay, this guy is worried about something else completely. He's worried about shortage cost, stock out cost, right? He's worried about the stock out cost when it is time to repair and I don't have enough spare parts, okay? And I'm talking about spare part for one equipment, that's okay. I can talk about a fleet of equipment and I don't have enough spare parts, right? So there are multiple scenarios. I'm just taking a very simple scenario, one single component, okay? So I have two costs that are also going to be, uh, I'll need to do a balancing act between the two. So now I have the shortage cost, which is very high because it's almost as if it's a unexpected failure, right? You have this machine down and you can't repair it and you can't put it back online because there is a missing spare part. <coughs> Make sense? Very good. And the inf inventory guys don't really talk to the maintenance guys. That's another problem. This guy does his optimization, spare part optimization, inventory, supply chain, and the maintenance guy does his maintenance. They don't really communicate a whole lot, okay? Then you have the holding cost. How much is it going to cost me every day to keep this and occupy this footprint and have this tied up capital in my storage? So now, if I am able to link the replacement with the lead time, with the costs, I can have a very simple model that optimizes the optimal ordering time for that spare part. So that that spare part comes exactly on time given the costs that I have, which are the shortage and the stock out, uh, sorry, the shortage and the holding, rather, and given the replacement time that I calculated from my previous model. Make sense? And by incorporating lead time, I can exactly pinpoint what is the best time to order that spare part. Does that make sense? Very good. So this is all good. Have I mentioned analytics? Not yet. Is it time to mention analytics? Absolutely. So let's talk about analytics. There is a whole par parallel universe to reliability. Again, the reliability was, the whole intention of reliability was to predict failures, right? There is a parallel universe that uses sensor data to predict failures. So a gas turbine, again, in a substation, has almost 2,000 to 3,000 sensors, just one. Okay, and these sensors are giving data. This is big data. So you can generate a few gigabytes per minute from these uh, turbines. So the classic approach to uh, utilizing sensors in the industrial world is to do something called condition monitoring, where you're monitoring the health of the asset, exactly like measuring your blood glu glucose every few hours if someone is diabetic or something. You're monitoring your blood glu glucose. With these sensors, you're actually monitoring the health of the equipment. Now, this is an example of raw data coming in. The classic approach, again, the mainstream of using condition monitoring is you define baselines, baseline signature, meaning this is the normal 
image or these are the normal amplitudes or characteristics of the data that is being generated by the sensors when everything is normal, right? And I'm going to train whatever model, statistical model, machine learning model, whatever it is, okay? And I'm going to start looking at detecting any deviations. So this is where analytics, machine learning comes into play. You're now analyzing, applying that to sensor data. Once you detect a fault, you can be as simple, it can be as simple as just detecting a, bad, a good versus a bad, or a fault versus no fault, or it can actually characterize some severity levels, which are, you know, here's a normal, here's an advisory alarm, here's a danger, you know, and so on. So these are the extent to which you can use condition monitoring. An example of a raw data, these are actual data coming from my lab, which you will see in a minute. Uh, this is a vibration spectrum coming from machinery, rotating machinery, I'm measuring vibration. So this is a spectrum when the machine is brand new, and as you go deeper into the slide, into this isometric, you find you know, frequencies increasing, and by the end here, this 100 meaning that you have accomplished 100% of the life, that's the failure. You can see the progression of these frequencies as they move along. So if you actually are doing any type of machine learning, you will immediately realize somewhere around this region, these frequencies started popping up, and now you have a fault that's going to progress over time until failure, right? There are techniques where you can pinpoint what frequencies are of interest, uh, and you know, monitor them over time. These are feature extraction. You have machine learning uh, uh, tools to extract the right features that correspond to the different faults and, and so on and monitor them. Now what am I going to do with these monitored faults or monitored measures? I can extract these features and develop something called a degradation signal. Okay, Degradation signal. Is it clear where the machine is actually fine? Machine is actually fine here, right? This is an amplitude, this is over time. I extracted those red dots, plotted them over time, right? So this is a non-defective phase, the other is a defective phase. Uh, this is the onset of a defect, correct? So I can say, okay, this is an onset of a defect. Most of the time, an onset of a defect does not require any repair, but you need to start monitoring it because over time this thing is going to progress and worsen. And until it hits a threshold, right? Until it hits a threshold, if you're lucky, it will, be, it will look like this, right? Uh, and this is an actual signal. So until it hits a specific alarm threshold, failure threshold, repair threshold, whatever threshold you define, uh, you will consider it as a failure. It can be something called a soft failure, where it's just, get, it, it's just guarded by this alarm, or it can be a hard failure or catastrophic failure. Okay, depending on the threshold that you define. Now what's interesting about this is that this signal does the same thing, like reliability, right? I still, I can, if, if I am able to model this signal properly, I can come up with a time to failure distribution. The reliability world, I modeled failure events. I had a failure after two months, I had a failure after three months, I had five failure after four months, and so on. So it's a completely different set of data. Here, I'm monitoring sensor data, right? And I'm, and if I can model it correctly, I can still come up with a similar time to failure distribution if I have multiple of these. Does that make sense? So what can happen is the following. I can start looking at which one to use. Should I rely on reliability or should I rely on the monitoring? Are there limitations of reliability versus monitoring or is condition monitoring better than reliability? In fact, there are, there are, they are very complementary if you dissect them and study them carefully. What's achievable using reliability is not necessarily achievable using uh, condition monitoring, right? So quantifying failure uncertainty it's very difficult to do with condition monitoring. Because what we did with that signal is that we defined a failure time. One failure time, right? 
I'm monitoring a specific equipment and I'm trying to extrapolate and forecast that signal when that signal is going to hit the threshold and I have a failure. Do I have a statistical distribution? Not really. Make sense? Very good. But with reliability, I have a bunch of repair time data and I'm monitoring and I can come up with a distribution. Now what's important, what's interesting about quantifying failure uncertainty is that you can now monetize risk. If you have a distribution, I can tag a cost to that. Did we see that? We just saw that, right? We just saw that with the optimal replacement and the optimal spare part ordering, right? So now, uh, because I have a distribution, I can now attach a dollar value to all the probabilities and come up with an optimization model, a, simple, a very simple optimization model. This helps me manage risk and it helps me in strategic decision making. It's long term. Every three months, do a, a, a preventive maintenance. Every five months, do a preventive maintenance and so on. But on the flip side, you have condition monitoring and what you can do with condition monitoring and what condition monitoring provides you can never be obtained from reliability. Why? Because condition monitoring gives you absolute visibility into each asset. With the sensors, it's almost transparent. It's like doing a, a CAT scan on the machine, right? This you can't get with reliability because even the data that you're using in reliability is very aggregate, right? So you can also detect faults using data. Reliability, you can't. You have an event of failure. You can't really detect a fault and track it. So what we are trying to do is to sync up the two, reliability and condition monitoring, combine them, and see how that impacts the entire cycle of replacement and spare part ordering. Make sense? So typically what we would like to do is the following. I would like to observe a partial signal and get a reliability curve, use that reliability curve to get a replacement cost curve, get a spare part ordering curve, come back, update my reliability curve, and I have an engine that updates, that links my data that I'm observing with the reliability or time to failure distribution that's constantly being updated, yes. That's a very good question. So there are two types of maintenance. You bring up a very important point. There is minimal repair, where you are bringing the part back to an operating state, but you're assuming that the age is the same. And there is total repair, where you're just replacing the whole thing, right? So each of these will require different models. So if you're doing minimal repair, maybe I will discount the amplitude, but not start from zero. Does that make sense? So if, let's say, I, I'm partially degraded over here, hitting this point, and now I'm doing a minimal repair, it might lower the amplitude and maybe to 0 0.15, and you start degrading again from 0 0.15, versus if you're doing a complete replacement, you, your amplitude will be at 0 0.005. So this is driven by the sensor data that's coming in. So the sensor data is actually going to govern where your amplitude and how efficient your maintenance was, right? Again, because the condition monitoring aspects and the sensors ha give you tremendous visibility. So you can have two types of technicians, one repaired, uh, made a lousy repair, another made a very good repair, and both repairs result in two different conditions as you progress with the two different components, okay? So I don't know how am I doing on time, okay. So let's, uh, let's actually, jump to a, uh, a live scenario here and so this is my lab it's on the fourth floor okay and what's what we're going to see is let me start to zoom in a bit so what you're seeing here is this is a rotating setup I'm measuring vibration. So this, uh, let me try to zoom in more, a little bit more. 
Yeah, this, this black wire here, this is a vibration sensor, so I'm measuring vibration. This is another vibration sensor at the back. I'm measuring speed using this sensor. I'm measuring load, how much load is applied on a uh, rotating piece that's inside this chamber. And I'm running this to you know, simulate failure. I don't want to be breaking machines because I'm not that rich. I would rather break uh, you know, cheap components and uh, So what we're going to do is actually turn this machine on and we're going to see how we can actually update and, and, and how the, the, whole, the whole system comes together. So this is the system here. This value here governs the 700 up here, governs how fast this thing is going to rotate. This is how much load I'm, I'm applying on the system. Uh, this is the second screen here gives me the raw data that's coming in. This is the post-process data. So now I'm going to process this data, extract features that are related to the component, monitor these features over time, right? And then do this dynamic updating of my replacement and inventory based on the amplitude of that degradation signal. Uh, where is my degradation signal? It's actually this region here. Make sense? So let's go ahead and start this and let me zoom in so that I make sure that the machine actually starts. center this guy and okay so machine is running and let's see how often I'm going to get the data I'm doing this in real time so I'm grabbing data and this guy is updating if you if it's averaging so I mean I hope you can see it it's you know these amplitudes are changing slightly because you're you're extracting, you're doing post-processing on this raw data, extracting the frequencies, those red dots that were on that vibration spectrum. And right here, it's, I'm seeing how the amplitudes are actually evolving every spectrum after one another. And I'm extracting these features into a degradation-based signal, right? Degradation-based signal now is right here every two seconds, right? Every two seconds, this, this figure here. I'm going to be updating. Does it need to be every two seconds? Absolutely not. I mean, if, if, you're run, if you need real-time updates, yeah, sure. Uh, can it be on a daily basis? Absolutely. Hourly, weekly, as much as you want, right? Uh, on aircrafts, it's actually in real time. So operators on the ground re you know, receive emails uh, if there is a fault on a specific aircraft or if some, some of the measures are out of spec. So. Now, what's interesting about this is the following. Right here, this, this, green cur uh, th this white curve here is actually the original reliability or time to failure distribution. The red and green are the last two updated versions of that same time to failure distribution based on the last two observations. Why do I have two? Because I, I, I would like to, just, just for visualization purposes, I want to track whether they're increasing or decreasing. If they are overlapped, so it's more stationary, right? And every two seconds, what's this curve and what's that curve? Look at this. This is the replacement cost curve that's being updated based on the red updated distribution, right? And this guy is the inventory ordering curve that's being updated. What am I, how am I getting these curves? I'm taking the, the red, the updated, time to failure distribution, and I'm actually tagging it with these costs. Cost of failure is 700 bucks. Cost of planned replacement is 150 bucks. There is an ordering lead time for the spare part, which is 10 days. There is a stock out cost, which is equal to 400 bucks. There is a holding cost of 10 cents a day. And I'm using these, I'm using the, these lower costs here to calculate this curve, and I'm using these upper costs to calculate this curve. 
right? The integration of this and this, there's a whole background engine of mathematics, okay? That I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I prefer not to show equations. Uh, I hate it when somebody shows equations and I don't understand, so I just decide, yeah. Uh, now, the actual lifetime is long, but when you tag these costs, you come up with an optimal replacement of 51, 32, based on the cost values. So let's do a small experiment here. What will happen? What do you think would happen if I increase this 150 to, say, $600? Does it make sense? Let's say 700, I'll, I'll make it exactly equal to the failure cost. Will it make sense to actually do any preventive maintenance? Run to failure, run to failure, just run it to the ground. Let's, let's see what this middle curve is going to look like if I do this as 700. Oh, All right, so, it completely ignored this, the, the, the condition at this point because I don't care, right? This guy is still being updated. Now you can see sl some movement here, but now what's overriding the decision is actually your cost, right? And this says if you do any repair or any replacement prior to failure, it's going to cost you money, right? Now if I start doing the balancing act again, It will immediately revert and give me the regular cost curve. Now, let's do another experiment. Let's say I am at 700, I'm at 700 RPMs. The speed is 700, right? Let's increase the speed to double. So this 700 now, I'm going to make it 1400, right? And please note the value of the ordering time and the value of the replacement time. What's going to happen and note how this, these two guys are going to now start separating from each other and one is going to be lagging because it means that I'm moving towards the left side of the screen, which means that my lifetime is getting shorter, which means that my ordering policy has to be expedited, right? So now it's order after three days, right? Order after zero, you have to order. You need to order right now. Even though the replacement is after 10 days, then that you already passed your lead time. Now, if I reduce this a bit, and you see how, how skewed your fa lifetime distribution is, right? It's very skewed. And if I go back and maybe reduce it to 1,000, okay, I think I lost connection at this point, so. Good, it, it served its purpose, so. Let's go back to, yeah, I think I froze, so it's okay. Uh, everyone got the gist of this. So now, uh, let's go back to what more can I do? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Very good. Very good, very good. It's very difficult when you have multiple sensors, and not only when you have multiple sensors, when you have multiple faults. A specific a vehicle can fail a thousand ways, right? So this is very important, this is very nice. So let me, let me I will get to that point in two minutes. So some of the interesting challenges now become when I'm monitoring a fleet, right? I'm monitoring a fleet, I have every asset, it's giving me its own, it's trending its own signal, it's communicating its own signal. I'm calculating the remaining lifetime distributions of every asset, and now I have to optimize, because every asset is giving me its own greedy, selfish, optimal spare part ordering. So you end up needing a overarching main, uh, optimization model that now optimizes your spare parts across this entire fleet. Does that make sense? So this is one direction that we're taking this work. The other 
direction is and this is not really the best time to freeze but when you have opportunistic maintenance so now this is an interesting scenario which really dive you need to dive down into the uh, designing new inventory models where if a component A is about to be maintained, you might as well replace component B. So now the inventory policy of one of component A is governed, is, is also affecting the inventory policy of two, right? Where does that happen? If the maintenance cost is so expensive, you need for offshore wind, wind, uh, uh, wind power applications, you need to sail out in the middle of the ocean, make sure that you have the right inventory, spare parts, because this is going to cost you like half a million dollars to just be there and do the replacements. So now it takes your spare part supply chain to a whole new different level and the impact of that, right? The same applies to manufacturing processes. If I'm going to shut down this machine, I might as well, um, and, and it's affecting my production line, how does opportunistic inventory policies of spare parts impact shutting down the machines? Okay, and what's the impact on throughput? And so on and so forth. Now, this is an interesting challenge where I have multiple sensors. One of the key issues is with the amount of sensors that you have, uh, or with the, the, the fact that they are very inexpensive, you can actually apply them to multiple units and assets, you end up with a big data problem, okay? And this is where things uh, become interesting. This is a very simple example here for a NASA turbine data set. Uh, you have 21 sensors, and these are overlapped signals from the 21 sensors. So you, you see each of them has its own uh, characteristics. So these are coming from 100 units for that specific sensor. And now you want to model this. The math becomes a little bit messy, but there is something inside the math that is really interesting, which is this guy here. Can anyone tell me what this guy is, what this matrix is? It's called a covariance matrix, right? Covariance matrix where you're actually looking at the relationship of every point on every sensor with the other point on every other sensor. Now, to model these, these were 100 points each, or actually, okay, 200 to 300 points each. We had issues. We had difficult issues because this matrix just blew up, okay? Especially when we're doing multivariate analysis. So with multivariate analyses, you will have to do some concatenation between these sensors. The length of the, sense of the, of the matrix or the width of the matrix becomes really large, and now, Let's say you want to do a matrix factorization or a matrix decomposition, singular value decomposition, eigen decomposition. Your matrix, your computation can no longer be handled on a small laptop or a regular laptop. In fact, with a, uh, uh, with a workstation, it was still problematic. Um, so, this is very interesting because now this was just with 21 sensors. So we started playing around with the number of sensors. And look at this. These are prediction errors. How close was I to actually predicting lifetime? Okay. The blue curve, I mean, you can ignore it for now, but this is a baseline. If I just take the best sensor and I make my prediction based on the best sensor and I ignore all the other sensors, right? The predictions are not too good, right? And the idea here is that the more sensors you leverage, the more information you have, and so you have to go that way, right? You have to go the, the difficult route of dealing with this covariance structure and so on. These two models are the yellow and there is a superimposed red model here. They are both the, sa the same algorithm, but one has become, has been re-engineered to become big data friendly. Re-engineering was not trivial, actually. It resulted in a couple of papers uh, that were published. So 
the predictions are very much the same, but then look at the time, look at the number of sensors and the scalability of your computational time with the number of sensors. So I started off with 100 sensors, both of them are doing fine. Then when you increase to 300 sensors per unit, right, per unit, so per asset, each asset has 300 sensors, your comp or 500 sensors, your computation time now between the two algorithms starts diverging. You move to 900 sensors per asset, and you see now that your scalability on the computational, on the computational side starts exploding, right? How is this going to impact? It's going to impact everything, right? It's going, because doing this fundamental work is going to impact your replacement, it's going to impact your prediction, it's going to impact your spare part supply chain at the end of the day, right? So, uh, another difficult uh, data set is image data. These are infrared images from, taken from the machine upstairs, and these images are big data. And I am trying to predict failure. So now, rather than having a time series observation, I'm having a whole matrix and having to model the evolution of this matrix. Right? So we use something called tensor-based methods, where now you're looking at a cube, which is made up of sequential images as opposed to a time series, a bunch of points. Each point is actually a whole image. And now you have to study the structure and the colors. The colors here are indicative of how, how uh, uh, hot the, the assets are and so on. Uh, and with this, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just uh, stop here and, and, uh, and you know, stop for any questions if, uh, if there are any. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Did anyone have any questions for Avi? If not, um, feel free to uh, stay in network and, and uh, not hear you around for, for a Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks.